The Sex Pistols were pioneers of the punk revolution in the UK. But when you scratch beneath the surface, you can see that they were actually a part of the system they were supposedly rebelling against, and one of the earliest examples of an industry plant. If I asked everyone watching what they thought an industry plant was, chances are there would be a number of different answers. But it basically boils down to one central thing, authenticity and also misdirection. In the same way that CIA or FBI would call their spies plants, an industry plant refers to an artist who has major labels or promoters secretly financially backing them and cultivating their image. And arguably, the two genres of music where authenticity means the most are hip-hop and punk rock. Punk rock came to light in New York in the mid-70s. Rock bands like the Stooges and the New York Dolls were channeling a more chaotic and aggressive energy than what came before, and this would be adopted and refined by the bands that followed them. In a music venue in New York known as the CDBG, a movement was happening, and bands like the Ramones, Television, and Blondie were cultivating an entirely new sound, look, and philosophy. Among the stunned audience members attending these nights at the CBGD was an English guy named Malcolm McLaren. He had become the manager of the New York Dolls and was checking out some new bands. He saw Richard Hell, the bass player of the band Television, and was mesmerized. Speaking about this moment, McLaren said, Richard Hell was a definite 100% inspiration. Horn and ripped t-shirt, this look, this image of the guy, this spiky hair. By being inspired by it, I was going to imitate it and transform it into something more English. Punk was a booming movement in the US and was also catching on in the UK. In order to capitalize on this new trend, McLaren rebranded a clothing boutique that he owned back in London. The store was initially called Let It Rock and then Too Fast To Live, Too Young To Die and sold clothing associated with rock music. When he got back to London, he rebranded his shop to the name Sex, and sold clothing more aligned with the punk movement growing within the UK. He ran this boutique with the fashion designer and his then-girlfriend Vivian Westwood. As well as running the store, he also decided that he still enjoyed being a music manager. However, he adopted a more cynical approach when managing his next music group. He decided that in the same way that everyone wanted to dress like the Beatles and the Rolling Stones, they could have their own band who wore clothing from their store, which would eventually bring customers to them. According to McLaren, we decided we needed mannequins to model our clothes, and that was when we invented the Sex Pistols, with Johnny doing his audition there in the shop. And he said, I thought the fashion was much more important than the music. Punk was the sound of that fashion. So instead of industry plans controlled by a label, the Sex Pistols were controlled by a clothing boutique in London. The group consisted of members of a band known as The Strand, and they auditioned for a singer. The Johnny McLaren refers to as John Lydon, who was hired more so for his punk attitude and looks rather than his musical talents. Lydon has since said that McLaren and Westwood were not really punks, but were actually capitalizing on the punk movement. He said, Malcolm and Vivian were really a pair of shysters. They would sell anything to any trend that they could grab onto. The Pistols toured throughout the UK. Their first single was called Anarchy in the UK, where Rotten describes himself as the Antichrist and calls for violent anarchy in the UK. The song was written and performed by the band, but McLaren was still behind the scenes trying to dictate what the music sounded like. Their bassist at the time was a guy named Glenn Matlock, who was the most technically gifted musician in the band. Speaking about recording Anarchy in the UK, he said, It was quite a lengthy process actually, because initially we went in with a guy who was our live sound engineer, Dave Goodman, who was kind of good enough. He had never really produced anybody properly, so he didn't have enough clout or wherewithal to tell Malcolm McLaren not to be in the studio. And Malcolm was like the devil at his ear going, it's not exciting enough, it's gotta be faster. And it was getting faster and faster and losing all its groove. McLaren was also well connected in the music industry and managed to get the Sex Pistols signed to EMI, despite only playing a few gigs together. This is another hallmark of an industry plan where the artists strike deals through who they know or who someone near them knows rather than the quality of their music or having built a base. Their music was controversial, but equally as important was their offstage antics. In a now famous interview with Bill Grundy, Johnny Rotten said a curse word live on British TV, causing outrage everywhere. They were also alleged to have spat and swore at airline officials while at Heathrow Airport, a controversy which caused EMI to drop them. And before they could even release their first album, Matlock left the band. McLaren claims that he fired him from the band because he went on too long about Paul McCartney. The Beatles was too much, 
Matlock has denied this and said that it was a mutual decision to leave the band. But if there were any doubt that the Sex Pistols were not about the music, it would become clear with who they decided to replace Matlock. McLaren recruited one of Johnny Rotten's friends named Sid Vicious, who really looked the part. Only problem was, he couldn't play the bass. And when they needed to record the album, he was in the hospital with hepatitis from injecting dirty needles. Speaking about this incident, the guitarist Stephen Jones said, To Cookie and me, it just didn't make any sense to have someone who couldn't play a note trying to fill Glenn's shoes, but it was never about the music for McLaren. From the minute Sid joined the band, nothing was ever normal again. And Matlock said, After I left, the band became just what Malcolm thought they should. They were the Sex Pistols as a cartoon strip. The group was then signed by A&M Records who dropped them after a week. The only label that would take them turned out to be Virgin Records, which was then a label owned by a young Richard Branson. So the Sex Pistols started working on their debut album, Never Mind the Bollocks, Here's the Sex Pistols. When recording the music, the bass guitar parts ended up being performed by their guitarist, Stephen Jones. Jones said, I would have loved Sid to have played on the record, but he just couldn't. He was in the hospital with hepatitis, so someone had to play bass, and I just stepped up. He started focusing on learning where to put his fingers, but after a while, he thought he was playing guitar. You can't do power chords on the bass, but Sid seemed to think he could, so that was a bit of a nightmare. Sid was purely there for the band's image. McLaren said, if Johnny Ryan is the voice of punk, then Vicious is the attitude. The band finished their first album, and Malcolm McLaren didn't anticipate just how good an album they could come up with. Despite their limited technical ability, they channeled an energy and aggression that became the soundtrack of a generation. Speaking about this album, Noel Gallagher from the band Oasis said, I was 10 when it came out. I remember hearing the song Bodies with a heroic amount of bad language. I have to say if push comes to shove, it's probably the greatest album of all time. People might say that's a ridiculous thing to say, but without that album, I don't think any of us would be doing what we do today. And particularly modern guitar music now comes from that record. The defining song of that album would be one which took shots at something that seemed sacred in the UK. Their song, God Save the Queen, opened with the lines, God Save the Queen, She Ain't Human Being. The song debuted at number one on the NME charts in the UK and peaked at number two on the BBC's official UK singles chart. Some made the claim that the charts had been fixed to prevent the song from peaking at number one as a result. In response, McLaren and Virgin got the Sex Pistols to perform the song in a boat outside the Houses of Parliament. In terms of influence, the Pistols were being compared to the Beatles and the Rolling Stones, and just like bands before them, their next step was to make it across the pond. However, US Customs were not so eager to have them in the country. The label had to put up a million dollar bond in order to secure two-week visas. And naturally, you would expect them to stop off in New York, the very birthplace of punk, but that was too easy. They instead traveled throughout the South, playing at Memphis, San Antonio, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, Dallas, Texas, and Tulsa, Oklahoma. Johnny Rotten said, We don't expect everyone to understand what's going on straight away. We're playing these cities because these are the people who will either accept us or hate us. They're not as pretentious as they are in New York. As they traveled through the cities, they were met with a mixture of skepticism and intrigue, and vicious heroin addiction was clearly getting the better of him, and he even unsuccessfully tried to take his life in Atlanta. His onstage antics often sparked outrage and condemnation, and in one gig, he called all of the audience by a slur. Jesse Sublett, who attended the San Antonio gig, said, It was instant mayhem. Cups, beer cans, food, trash, spit flew toward the stage. The sound was loud, extremely lo-fi, but the band was tight for about 10 seconds. Steve Jones broke a string and the song Holiday in the Sun almost fell apart, but they got it back together and performed like gangbusters. Except for Sid, who was a pretty awful bass player. His mistakes kind of got swallowed up in the roar, and he was fascinating slash revolting to look at, so it balanced out. As the tour traveled further west and approached the west coast, the most hospitable city for them to play in would be LA. So naturally, they chose to play in Winterland in San Francisco instead. Steve Jones recalled the gig and said, At Winterland, I had a cold. Sid wasn't playing a note, and he wasn't even plugged in half the time. Me and Paul just wanted to play. I kept cutting out, strings breaking left, right, and center. After a disastrous tour and a disastrous final show, Johnny Rotten said at the final gig on stage, Ever get the feeling you've been cheated? The Sex Pistols would arrive in New York, but purely for a connecting flight back to the UK. 
When they arrived at JFK, Sid slipped into a drug-induced coma and was taken to a hospital in Queens. The doctor told him that if he didn't quit drinking, he would be dead within six months. And with their American tour being such a catastrophic failure, the band broke up. McLaren soon issued a statement which read, The management is bored with managing the successful rock and roll band. The group is bored with being a successful rock and roll band. Burning venues and destroying record companies is more creative than making it. Outside of the Sex Pistols, Sid was also known for his relationship with Nancy Splungeon, who the two were a regular fixture in the British tabloid press. They then traveled to film a documentary called The Great Rock and Roll Swindle about the band and how it was supposedly a scam devised by Malcolm to sell clothing. Back in London, Vicious bumped into Glenn Matlock, who had already started a band named Rich Kids. Matlock asked Vicious to be the frontman of the group and renamed them Vicious White Kids. They performed once at the Electric Ballroom in London, where Nancy did backing vocals, but Matlock made sure to turn off her microphone. With the reckless lives that Sid and Nancy were leading, tragedy was no longer possible, it was inevitable. In October 1978, both of them spent time having drug binges at the Chelsea Hotel in New York City, and one morning, Sid rushed down to the reception at 10 a.m. pleading for help. He had found Nancy dead on the bathroom floor with stab wounds in her back. Sid was arrested and charged with her murder. He was set to stand trial, but after being released on bail, he died of a heroin overdose. The true story of how Nancy died remains a mystery to this day. As for the other members, they would be reasonably successful in other bands, but never reach those same heights again. The aftermath has led to two extreme conclusions. The Sex Pistols were Britain's defining punk band, or they were Britain's first ever boy band, and paved the way for the industry plants we see today. Like most things, the answer is probably somewhere in between. Make sure to subscribe for more.